So hi everyone, uh, I'm Akif. Uh, today we're going to be is not really like uh, any of our other presentations. It's less about an algorithm, data structures topic, uh, and we're instead going to be just talking about different uh, tricks and data structures and algorithms you can use that are already built in to C++. Um, and so this, the C++ sort of standard library is called the STL. Uh, that's what the name of the presentation is. Yes. This is called the, it stands for the Standard Template Library. Um, and it has a lot of cool features, and we're going to go over a lot of them uh, today. OK. Uh, so first off, um, th this is uh, something you should have in basically all of your programs. So in C and C++, right, you have to include different header files if you want to use different libraries or different um, data structures or algorithms that are pre-provided. So you have to use include files. Um, luckily, uh, for competitive programming, uh, there's this one include file, uh, studc++.h, that basically contains all other include files that are standard. Um, so any sort of data structure from the STL, any sort of algorithm from the STL, um, any math or string or uh, operations like that, um, will all their include files will all be uh, part of this one giant include file. So that's really useful, and it saves a lot of typing. Um, so just remember this. If you're on Windows or be using some different compiler, this might not work out of the box. Um, and there are code forces blogs you can find about how to set this up for your particular situation. Um, but on the actual code forces online judge and ICPC judges and stuff, you'll be able to use this and that'll be fine. Um, um, then the, okay, the next thing sort of akin to this is this using declaration. Um, so again, in C++, um, if you import something using include like this, right? Um, they might define a lot of their algorithms or data structures in a namespace. Um, and then, so when you're using that actual data structure algorithm, uh, uh, you might have to prefix this stud colon colon before that function or class. Um, however, if you, and if you prefix your entire code with this using namespace stud, um, the compiler will know that you're implicitly in this namespace, S namespace std. Um, so then any sort of function or class that you use uh, will uh, it'll also look in namespace std without you prefixing it with this std colon colon yourself. This is also very useful, saves a lot of typing. Okay, um, okay uh, this is some other stuff that is, again, useful in saving typing, uh, more saves along the same lines. Um, so in competitive programming, it's often, 99% uh, of the time, better to just use uh, long, long ints as opposed to just standard ints. Um, so long, long ints are 64 bits versus normal ints are 32 bits. Um, and it's very, very easy to not pay attention to overflow and end up overflowing across 32 bits. Um, and it's so many times you can, you'll, you'll think that, oh, no, I can just use an int because I'll never go over 32 bits. And there's some multiplication that you do that uh, you don't keep track of and it gives you over. And then you just spent, spent like an hour figuring out why uh, you w 125, right? So it's uh, very often, uh, well, I mean, uh, I recommend, and I think Joe and Adam would agree with me, that it's good practice to just always uh, use long longs as opposed to ints. And so this is a way to sort of do that. Instead of having to type t long long int every time, you can use this type def. And what a type def does is it lets you, as, as the name sounds, give another name for another t for some other type. So here we take the original type long long int, and we give it the name ll. Um, that's the one I customarily use, and Joe also uses. Um, some uh, other people have their own names, and you, you can do whatever like feels comfortable to you. Um, but then, whenever instead of using ints, uh, you basically just never use ints. You always use LLs throughout the rest of your code. Um, similarly, um, this is less sort of uh, strict, but uh, if you don't want to use, if you want to use long doubles without having to type out long double, we can type def ld in this case. And that's what I do. There's one question. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Uh, I, I think if you like have this, this length modifier without putting anything after it, it is units and int. So if you long long, it makes a long long int. So it's, it's the same thing. Yeah. So so yeah, I'm uh, over here. So I'm using long doubles, which are I think 80 bit floating point uh, values, and I call them LDs, and I use them most of the time. If I don't have to, you know, worry about speed or anything, I just use long doubles, so over normal doubles. Um, this is not something I do, but uh, I think Joe does this. Um, where he typed as a pair, which we'll get to later, but he, this is something that a uh, type that you might use often, and he defines a pair of longs um, as a PL. Uh, so just small names to save you typing that you can do with type defs here. Um, 
this is not something that comes up usually in, in, in uh, Code Forcer rounds, but all in ICPC uh, type competitions, this will come up a lot. Um, and where you want to have this sort of um, a point type, a point data type, a point in, in 2D space, it can be very useful instead of defining your own point class to instead just use uh, the built in complex uh, number types. So these are uh, complex like imaginary numbers, that type of thing. Uh, so if you use complex of a, a, a LD here uh, and define that as a point, that can be useful uh, sometimes. So, again, the, the most of these are optional. I highly recommend doing something for ints and longs, but the other ones are up to you. And even the name for the first one is up to you. Um, okay. So now we're going to get to um, the data structures in the STL. Okay. So the first data structure this is you're using all the time is called a vector. Uh, this is basically the exact same thing as what is known as an array list in Java. If you've like taken data structure or something you experienced with Java, uh, this is the same thing as an array list. So what it lets you do is, like an array, it lets you get and set values anywhere in the array in constant time. Um, but also, like a list, it lets you add and delete from the back of the thing, also an amortized O1 time. So sort of best of both worlds here. Um, unlike a list, you can't insert or delete from the middle uh, without taking linear time. But at the beginning, at the end, um, you can delete or add just in constant time, which is really nice and useful. So here are some examples of how to use that. So there's a few different ways to construct a vector. The, the first is by just doing literal construction. So you can say v equals, just like type out what the elements are. Next is just the default, which is if you just have no, cons no uh, parameters to construct, it's v2. It just makes an empty vector. Um, next is, is, I'm doing this over here with v3, is you can provide just the size of the vector you want. And it'll do what's called known as default initialization, default initialization for the rest of the elements. So it'll make a vector of size 10, and it'll just fill them with zeros. Um, finally, you can do this where you specify the type, the, the, the size, and the starting value. So this will make a v4 will make a vector of size 10, and it'll set everything in negative 1 originally. Okay. Um, so what's the, okay, and what else can you do? So you can, like an array, uh, access just elements in the middle. So here I'm showing count uh, v3, v index 3, right? So that just picks the element at index 3 and gives it to you, like an array. Um, you can append to the end of it with this push back method. So here I'm adding 25 to the end of the array. Um, there's also in place back, uh, which is slightly different, and uh, I'll get into that later, I think, when, when we talk about different types, uh, when we have access to more types. Um, then there is pop back, which deletes from the back. And finally, there's the actual back function, which gives you the last element in the array. So this is the back is equivalent to. Uh, v uh, index v dot size minus 1. But it's very often much faster to type v dot back. Uh, right, right, right. So like an array list, um, when you append to this, so the way the vectors work is that uh, when you sort of vectors out pre-allocate a range of space for you. Um, and then when you fill them up, like you keep on push back, push back, push back, and if you fill it up, what the vector will do is it'll double the size of the array. Yeah, yeah, see, it's deamortized. So, yeah, so it'll, it'll double the size of the array. Um, so, it'll allocate a completely new region of memory and copy everything over to that region. Um, and so, that will take linear time. But the nice thing is, is that it only does that once for every, like, n elements, right? Um, and so, the adding and deleting at the end, amortize will take a one time, even, but even if any specific uh, append or pushback might take linear time, and then all the other ones for a while will take constant time. But overall, uh, if you take the average, it will only be constant time per operation. OK. So yeah, that's that. Um, so before I move into sort of more different types of d data types, I want to talk about take a second to talk about templates. So as I mentioned before, this library, the STL, stands for the Standard Template and Library. Right? Um, and that's the reason for that is because all the, the algorithms and data structures in this library um, utilize what are known as C++ templates. So a template is a parameterized type. Um, and the idea is, is that you write code once, and you write it with this, in this templated way. Um, and the compiler sort of copies and pastes that code for you um, and to f for every different parameteriza parameterization that you use of it. So you write a function, you write a class with some, in a templated way. And then later down the road, if you call that function or class uh, with an int, or with a car, or with a string, or whatever, right? Um, it will sort of copy that, it will make a version of that function for int. So it'll make that version of function for cars, and then so on and so forth. Um, and so here you see examples. So I can 
for example, I can use make a vector of LLs right here. But I can also make a vector of pairs. And again, we'll get into pair what pairs are later. But there's some other type that are not the same as longs, not the same as LLs. They're a different type. Right? So I can, I can make a vector of LLs, or I can make a vector of pairs. And so the C++ library only has one set of code for, these, for this, but it's templated. So the compiler can just sort of do a find replace in that code and replace it with a pair and LLs. Right? Um, and you can, you can, so in these, as I said, you can nest these templates. So for example, a pair is also a templated type here. So it's a pair of a long and a long, and then I can put that into, and then pair, use that to parameterize what a vector will be. So we'll make a vector of pairs of longs. And, then, uh, and another thing to realize is that uh, these templates can be heterogeneous. So that means uh, for each different like, part of the template, uh, you can give different types. So here, uh, I can make a pair of, of a car and a double. They don't, they don't have to be the same type. Or example here, I can make a pair, even do a pair of a vector and, and, and a number. So there's all sorts of ways you can just combine these as arbitrarily as you want. Right. Um, and uh, this is totally out of the scope of the presentation, but if, if you guys are interested, I highly recommend looking up template metaprogramming. It's, you can do very, very crazy stuff with these templates. It's even Turing complete. Um, so it's something cool to check out if you want. OK, okay so now, uh, OK, uh, next thing. Uh, so we talked about vectors, right? Um, uh, and so one thing, thing you can do with a vector is use its copy constructor. Um, and this is not something just for vectors, but any of the data types I will mention from now on, you can use with the copy constructor. Um, so if you, want, if you have some container already, some, some vector, let's say in this case, right, uh, A, and you want to make another vector with the same elements, you can just pass A into B, and it'll copy it. Um, and you, can, you don't even have to type the uh, type of B. You can use the auto type. And that way, B will, be, B will know, the compiler will know that what type B has to be. It has to be the same type as A here. Um, even nicer, you can just use the equal signs, and equal signs will automatically call the copy constructor for you, and it'll copy all the data over. And so later, when you change the elements in B, right, and you append or delete or anything, it won't change A if you use equal sign like this. Um, it'll just make a separate copy with the copy constructor. Um, and, and again, this extends to all, basically all the STL data types. Their copy constructor with, will work when you do the equal signs or just pass it in as the input to the constructor. Uh, it'll just make a new version, of, new copy of the, L, of the construct container. Okay. Uh, next data type is, as, as, as you've kind of guessed from the previous slide, there's a data type called pairs. Um, and the idea behind pairs is that it lets you store two different data types in one data type. It glues them together. Um, so there's a bunch of times when they're useful. Uh, probably the mo foremost is when you want to sort or shuffle um, some objects, right? Some, some, some of these pairs. Um, but you want to keep the halves of the pair together. So if you have, let's say you want to sort by the first element in the pair, but you also want to remember what the second element associated with it was. So okay, I'm back at a question. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I was mentioning before. It, it's it's copying. It's a copy constructor. So when you use an equal sign, unlike Java or something, maybe I don't know what Java does. Uh, it will. Well, I know Python doesn't. Python doesn't copy. Python has a reference. In this case, C++ will. If you either if you use the equal signs or the pass it in, it'll actually make a full copy of the data, like a full deep copy of everything. Yeah, yeah, that's you're right, you're right. Yeah, that's what Java does. Yeah, Python is the same thing. Also, where it's uh, it might be annoying if you pass in a, like if you, it's kind of annoying if you pass into a function, right? Like you have to remember to make a copy if you want to edit it. Um, but in C++, you don't you don't have to worry about it. The default behavior for everything is passed by value, so it makes a copy. If we pass it into a function, if you use an equal sign, anything like that, it'll make a full copy for everything. Um, you have to be explicit if you want the reference or the pointer instead, because it's the opposite way from Java and Python. Okay, so uh, back to pairs. Um, so yeah, so as I mentioned before, if you want to sort of associate two values together and sort by one of them, right, and remember what the other guy's going to be, that's very useful. It comes up a lot. Um, another place where they're useful if you have a function, and you want to return two values. So sort of the way you would want to do this in, in plain C would be to have like an out parameter. But that's very cumbersome. And in C++, you can just use a pair instead and just bundle your two values together and, and throw them out of the function as a return type. Um, uh, you can access yeah, so if you now you this pair, you can access values in that pair using first dot first and dot second. So it's like they made a, a structure or class for you where you can just but it's templated, which is nice. So you can uh, just make make a pair of anything you want, and then like you would for any other structure class, use dot first and dot second. Um, another nice thing is that pairs have a built-in comparator, which sorts by their first value first and then by their second value second. So it's like a lexicographic. So um, if the first values are different, it'll sort by the first values. If the first values are the same, it'll sort by the second values. So you have a priority to the first value. Um, so here's an example using a pair. So pair of LL and string, so it makes it 
uh, LL first and then a string, right? And then first and second. Um, and this is just a data type, so you can do anything you would with a normal data type, even though it's templated. So you can make an array out of it like this, right? Um, and then you can, uh, once you have this, you can use you can uh, access this dot first and dot second. Um, and you can even and then what you're doing in this code is you're reading into their dot first and dot second, and that's something you can do also, just as you would any other struct field. Okay. Okay. Uh, now from pairs we can move on to something very similar, which is called tuples. Um, so, ex so unlike pairs, um, you don't have to only stick with two elements. You can go to like as many elements as you need. Um, but this the, the, the elements that you use have to be fixed at compile time. That's the difference between like a tuple and a vector. A vector is just uh, at runtime you make it. You say at runtime you can say I want to make a vector of size uh, n. A tuple is uh, you can have um, you at compile time you're telling the compiler I'm gonna want to have this this container of size three or four or whatever. And again, unlike a vector, these can be heterogeneous. So you having a tuple in this case of string, a long, and a double, a long double, right? So you just, whatever types you want, just glue them together exactly like you do with a struct. Except there's a whole bunch of convenience functions already built in for you. So one convenience function is this con nice constructor built in. So you can just just literally define what what they're going to be and just do like this, which you can't do with a struct, right? So you just do this, um, and so you can see the first one's a string, the second one's a long, the third one's a double, long double, um, and unlike the uh, pair here, you can't use dot first and dot second. Um, you have to use get zero, get one, get two, like this. Um, and so again, like a pair, is useful when you want to sort by a key or by one of the values, and then remember some of the other values, or you want to sort by two values, like maybe an x coordinate, a y coordinate, and remember some other information about the rest of the values. Um, something interesting here is not maybe not super relevant, but uh, is that you can see here that templates don't have to be templated only on types. So this get function is templated on a number. So you pass it the number zero, and it makes a new copy of the get function for every number you pass it. It's kind of cool. So this is like, so 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 the compiler actually makes copies of the get function for get zero, get one, and get two. Um, so it all runs very very fast, li exactly like 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 as fast as you would if you hadn't used a tuple. And you just had individual values being passed around, so it's very, very fast. You don't have to worry about speed for tuples and pairs at all. It's as fast as struct or something. Okay. Um, any questions on this on these pairs and tuples? Okay. Um, so sets. Um, so this is uh, akin to in Java you might have been ex seen the tree set. Um, so what this is is this is a b balanced binary tree, self-balancing binary tree. Um, and let's, uh, specifically, it's a red-black tree in, in implementation. Um, you, in data structures, you might have seen an AVL tree. It's similar except it uses a different method of balancing. Uh, so it, what this tree structure lets you do is that it lets you have uh, log n, insert, query, and delete. So you can insert objects, you can look it up by a key, you can delete objects and log in, um, and yeah. Um, and you can check whether or not a key exists in this set also, right? That's the other thing. And this set does not store duplicates. So if you insert something twice, it won't insert it again. It'll just say that single time. Um, so, right. so again, this is a templated type. So you, this set can be not only of this LLs like I have in this example, but you can store pairs or anything else like that. Um, uh, one sort of caveat is that this type that you store in there has to be comparable. It has to be a comparator associated with it. Um, but most, almost all built-in STL types do have comparators. It's only if you do your own custom structure class that you have to write your own comparator. But otherwise, um, it, everything is built in. Even vectors and uh, other sets. Uh, so you can put a set inside a set even, because sets have comparators and vectors have comparators too. Uh, but pairs and integers and everything all definitely have comparators. Um, so Use, you can use a dot count to check existence, and you can use dot insert and dot erase to insert and delete things. Right? Um, so here's an example. So uh, this is the example is you're counting number of duplicate elements out of n given elements. So you have this set up this um, set, um, and you loop over n elements, and you, you read the elements. And if it already exists, you increment your answer. If it doesn't exist, you insert it. So, and, and notice I don't have to put an else here, because if you insert something twice, it just inserts it once. It doesn't insert it again. Everyone see how this code is working? OK. 
Okay, yeah, and just the thing to mention is that if you do want to store elements multiple times, uh, you, you can use a multi-set instead. Um, those are often kind of a little harder to use. It's not as nice to use, so I kind of shy away from using them. But if you feel comfortable with it and if you need it, uh, definitely go for that also. Um, okay. Uh, next is in the same uh, vein as sets, we have maps. So this is like a set, except uh, along with every sort of key element in there, you also have a value element. So things are sorted by their keys, but you have a, everything is also sorted with the value element. Um, so a very, very common use case for this is to count how many things an element appear, a number of times in some element appears. Um, so here, you, so, and by the way, so the way you declare them here is you have a map from the key type to the value type. So this is from LL to LL. Right, um, and un unlike last, so the key type still has to be comparable. The value type can be whatever; it doesn't have really any restrictions on it. Um, so here, you we're reading, uh, we're looping over all the values, and we can just say count next plus plus. So we take that item and we increment the number of times it appears, right? So, and then we can say, and then when you loop over uh, this data type, um, you'll get pairs. The first pair will be the key. The second pair item in the pair will be the value. Uh, so here, so, so we'll say the key type appeared value number of type times. Um, and so here, right, if we, when, once we access count next, um, notice we haven't inserted anything into this, right? Um, but that's OK, because if you just uh, access a key that hasn't, doesn't exist, it'll be default initialized. And so for numbers, that means it gets set to 0. So in our use case here, where we're counting stuff, uh, that's perfect. So because if we access an element that doesn't appear, it gets set to 0. And then we increment how many times it appears, so it comes 1. Uh, so a map is multiple uh, instances of something. So a, a pair is just a single key and a value, right? Or not key value, single first element and second type, right? A map stores multiple key value pairs, right? So, so it's uh, it only stores one of each key, but then for each key, it has an associated value. So it's like a dictionary in Python, if you want to think about it that way. So and the way you use it again, similar to dictionary in Python, is that you use this bracket notation like you would in an array. Um, so here we're using this. So again, as I said, the example was that we want to count how many times any time some element appears. So for every element that we're looping over, we look at it look at it as a key value in this map, and we increment the number of its value, which is the number of times it appears. Um, again, like before, you can use multi-map, which lets you store multiple instances of each key if you want to, for for duplicate keys. What's the major difference between wrapping pairs and vector map? Well, so if you wrap a pair, uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, the map is more like the set from the previous slide, right? So if you uh, wrap a pair into, into a bunch of vectors, you can, uh, which is something that we often do, uh, the only operation you sort of have access to, right, in a reasonable amount of time is appending to the end or popping back from the end or accessing anything in the middle, right, or changing anything in the middle. Um, you don't have any way to check whether or not a key exists, right? So if you store a key KV pairs in a vector, how are you going to check whether or not uh, the key 5 exists without looping over the entire vector? You can't. But because this map uses the, same, the exact same tree structure from the set slide that I mentioned, this can, in log n time, uh, do the tree thing and then check whether or not that key exists. Right? And if it does exist, it can give back the value that is associated with that. And, if it does, and it can also insert very fast um, in log n time again, exactly like the set. Right, so maybe one thing you want to think about is sort of like um, you wrap your key value pairs in set as opposed to in a vector, but it also provides very nice syntax with this bracket notation and stuff and other stuff, um, unlike just directly wrapping in a set. And also the second element is something comparable, which is also nice. Uh, so how would lookup even work? So I, I showed you the, this. This is how lookup is doing it. Wait, do you mean like implementation-wise or like how to use lookup? Because if how to use lookup is literally like this. So you just Use the brackets and that that's it. And it gives you the value, and you can read that value just by look taking it, or you can do like a plus equals to change it, or like an even in, or an equals to change it for plus equals or whatever. Ah, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, that that's why I don't like to use multi maps very often uh, for this exact reason. Um, but so you, you can you can use a dot find function that a multi map has. 
Um, and so that's sort of find um, a key, the, the sort of the, uh, the first, I think the first time a key appears or something. And you can sort of plus plus that thing until it stops appearing. I'm not actually not sure of the details. I don't know if Joel knows the details for this. Um, this is also, yeah, it's, it's not uh, very easy to use a multi map. It's not super hard either, I don't think. I just haven't learned how to do it. Um, you can look it up if you want. Um, but the, the nice part is because um, we have this templating system, right? There really isn't a need to use a multi map. If you want to store multiple values with the same key, you can just do a map from your key type to a vector of your value types, or a set of your value types, however you want to do it. So then, if you want to insert a new item for a key value pair, right, you can just do key and look at its vector and then do a dot push back. Right? And then to loop over all the values associated with a certain key, you just loop over the vector associated with that key. This is a very good uh, demonstration of how powerful this templating uh, lets you be. OK. There's no more questions, I think. I'll move on. OK. Uh, last data type we're going to talk about are strings. Um, so these are much nicer to work with than normal C strings. Um, so first off, they have all the basic operations that a vector has. So you, like, the, the pushback, popback, access elements in the middle, all that. Um, so it's kind of like a vector of car in that sense, but it has even more stuff than that. So, um, and as they amortize pushback, uh, amortize uh, you know O1 pushback and everything. Um, but you can also use a, a plus to concatenate. So if you have one string and another string, and you do plus, it makes a new string, which is the concatenation of the two, um, unlike vectors. Um, also, you can do plus equals to do push back a whole string to the end of it, to to your old string to, to new string to the old string. Um, yeah, and unlike Java, this is fast. Uh, this is this takes as much time as necessary for, to add the new string to the old string, because basically what it does under the hood is it calls push back for every element in the new string, for every car in the new string. So it's fast, unlike C and Java, which has to make a new string entirely. Um, and same same in Python. It's Python C and Java is slow because it makes a new string here. Uh, it can just do push back basically equivalent. So here is an example of how to use it. Um, so the default constructor for a string is just empty string, but you can also, like a vector, do like this type of thing, where you give it how many and what value. Um, you can read into a string using cn. You can append a car to a string. And as we mentioned here, you can append an entire string to another string. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of other string functions that you would expect. So um, there's a couple here that are most useful are substr, which is a substring. So you can do a substring from the start position and how long you want a substring of. Um, you can also do without find, which looks for a car, or looks for another string in as a substring of another string. Um, and yeah, so dot data gives you an access to the underlying C string, which is null terminated, like you would expect. Um, so if you're more comfortable with your old C functions as opposed to the C plus functions for uh, working with strings, like you know, you stir talk or A2I and all those guys, um, you can use them on this C++ string just by calling them instead of on the original C++ string, calling on it the dot data of it. So that gives you your null terminated string that you can use. OK? Uh, it's the same function, I think. I, I think like it's a historical thing that they're different names. Before, they used to implement the slightly differently or something. One was const and the other one wasn't or something. But I think as of now, they're the exact same function. Yeah. OK. Um, so, okay, so now we're going to go over the other half sort of, of the SEO library. So we covered like some of the data structures. Now we're going to cover the algorithms that work on the data structures. That operate on them. Um, so before we get to the actual algorithms themselves, though, I'm going to talk about iterators. So an iterator is a generalization of a pointer from like C. So if you're familiar with C, we, we, you've seen pointers, which are like locations into memory. Um, and C++ generalized that idea to talk about um, to, to in the sense in the way of iterators, which let you do much nicer uh, things than just raw pointers, which is raw access memories. Um, but but Similar to pointers, they do point to elements. But however, instead of pointing to general regions in memory, uh, they instead point to specific elements in STL containers. Um, and so the reason why these iterators are so important is because the STL algorithms, which I'll get to, uh, don't operate on, raw, on the actual containers themselves. So you can't like pass in a vector or a set 
to an STL um, algorithm, you instead uh, have to pass in iterators, which uh, refer to ranges in the, uh, in the container. So instead of, so we're going to get to how all this works exactly later, but instead of sorting a vector, um, you want to sort uh, a range in that vector. So if you look at this example code, right, uh, we'll get its begin vector, uh, so the vector.begin, and we get vector.end. And it sorts the entire, and that basically just sorts the entire vector. Um, and so these range, so all these uh, algorithms that we'll get to, uh, the ranges that they operate on are going to be half open, right? So half open means that uh, it includes this first. So if you have a range a b, right? If it's half half open, it includes this a, but it doesn't include b. It just includes b minus one. Um, and so all these algorithms use the same sort of convention, in which the ranges they expect as input or the range of the output will all be half open. Um, and so you can call various functions on containers, like vectors or sets, to get iterators from them, which you then pass into your algorithms to do things. Okay. Um, also, as I mentioned before, these are generalizations of pointers. So pointers themselves, like normal array pointers, are iterators also. So here, for example, if you have an array of size ten, like this, you can just sort it. Uh, as you, so this is a pointer. Right? This, uh, this, if you pass in the array A here, it decays into a pointer, just like it would in C. And similarly, if you add 10 to it, it looks at the pointer 10 forward. right? And again, it decays. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is a half open range. right? So it, A is included, the A0 is included, but A plus 10 is not, which is good, because A plus 10 will be out of bounds. So there's no actual element in A plus 10, um, but it's not actually included. It's past the end. It's half open. OK, so let, let's get some more code to show you more what's happening with uh, iterators. Um, so first off, there's different types of iterators. Um, one type of iterator, which is the type of iterator you might get from a vector, are random access iterators. So these are very like much like pointers, where you can just do whatever you want with them. So if you look at the vector here, um, you can get v.begin to get its beginning iterator, which is the iterator of pointed element v0. Um, and you can, like pointers, just add to them as, as, as you want. So you can do plus 5, and that gives another iterator, which is at element 5, element index 5. Um, similar like pointers, uh, you can also use the star arrow operator to sort of dereference them, like you would a pointer. So if you want the element that the iterator points to, you call, use a star, and that gives that element. So here, we're just looking at the element at position 5, and we're dereferencing it to actually print out the element at v5. So this is one example of how you would use them. Um, but as I, was, okay, as I mentioned before in the previous bullet point, is that some iterators are random, like vector iterators, but others are not. So for example, set and map iterators, you cannot like, just randomly uh, move them forward or backwards by any amount you, you please. You can only move them forward or back a single position at a time. So here, we look at this, this, pair, uh, this set of pairs, uh, let's say, and we get a, um, a vector from it, right? Uh, an iterator from it. Uh, that's the typo. That's just the s.begin, again, my bad. Uh, we get an iterator from it, um, and we can now move around with it. We can, we can move that iterator around, but unlike the vector iterator, we can't move it around by a random amount. We can only move it back and forth by one. Um, and the other thing here is, like a pointer, we can use the arrow operator to dereference it and then access a member. So here, this is like equivalent to doing star s it dot first, right? And so this is taking the first element at the first position um, and printing it. Everyone clear on what the syntax is here? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so for example here, right, in the first one, uh, I'll just print out 0, because all the elements in the vector are 0, right? Um, but uh, if you had filled it up with some actual elements, it would just print out the element of position 5. Um, here, we take the beginning iterator, like the start iterator, so it points the first element in the set, the smallest element, lexigraph, like, like the sorted order. Um, then it moves it forward one, then I move it back one, so it's back to the original position. Um, and then it prints out the first sort of, uh, the, the dot first of it. So whatever it, it pairs we put into it, it would take the first in the sorted order and print out its dot first. So, so no, notice the reason I use an arrow, if you're not familiar with C notation, uh, is that w this is equivalent to doing star first to dereference it and get the actual element, the actual pair, 
that this pointed to, and then calling dial first on it. So you can just do it in a short form using the arrow. Okay. Okay. So now, how do we Wait, actually? So, yeah. um, because the set is initially empty, when you defer de reference dot begin, it would just say vault, right? Oh, I, I have a comment here which says fill it up. Oh, good point. <laughs> okay. But yeah, if if you were to do this to an empty element, it would be an empty set or vector or something, like an a, a, a iterator that's out of bounds, right? It doesn't point to anything real. It would be undefined behavior. So it could sec fault, it could just like print out garbage value, it could do whatever. Um, you want to avoid that because often it it'll, like, might seem that it's behaving on your computer, but then when you go to the online judge, it'll do sec fault and that'll be really annoying. So you want to make sure that you're completely in bounds and stuff, like you would with normal arrays or whatever. OK. So how do we actually get these iterators, right? So I mentioned you can use functions on them. So the most common way is use dot .begin and dot .end. So with your container, your vector, your set, or whatever, it's called dot .begin, it's the first one, right? In, uh, in, in the vector, it would be the element of position 0. For a set, it would be the one, like the smallest guy in sorted order, because sets are stored sorted, because um, it, it's a binary search tree, right? It's a sort sorted. Um, but you can also call dot .end. And so the interesting part is, because I mentioned before, all the algorithms in this, uh, the convention here is that everything works on half open ranges. So end actually doesn't give you the last element, but it gives you the element sort of one past the end. So there's no actual element there, but it'll be pointing to the position one past the end. Because um, it's not illegal to have an iterator that sort of goes out of bounds. It's illegal to use that iterator to do anything useful, like to actually dereference that and get the element there. That's illegal. But you can have an uh, 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 iterator that's pointing like out of bounds. Um, the other thing you can do is you can use reverse iterators, so R begin and R end. So this, this basically, these iterators, when you, so if you increment a reverse iterator, it'll actually move backwards, which is kind of funny. And if you decrement it, it'll move forwards. And this, these can be useful. Um, so R begin points to the last element here, and R end points to one before the first. So it's kind of just a mirror image of what we did before the previous bullet point. And so any other iterator will just like point in the middle. So if you have a vector, if you want to get, as we saw in the previous slide, if you want to get the element of position i, you can take dot begin and then do plus plus i, right? Um, and yeah. And so okay, some other so uh, another nice thing that uh, we just probably saw this in like a previous slide um, is that these these for each uh, stuff. So this this notation is equal plus two to a for each loop with this colon, um, and this basically loops through the entire container. Um, but actually, uh, under the hood, it's just syntactic sugar for um, using iterators. So the, what this is actually equivalent to um, is that it does this. So it, it starts with dot begin, right? And then it loops until we hit dot end, and every time it increments that iterator. And then you have to remember to dereference it if you actually use it. So you don't actually ever write this code because it'll be written for you with, and if you use this. But it's like a nice example to explain how iterators actually work. Everyone, everyone see what's happening there? And, and you actually might have to write this code if you want to loop backwards to a, a container, maybe, right? So then you would have to do R begin R end here instead. So that might be something you want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So, so if you if you call dot begin initially, um, right, it'll give you this first element. So if you do plus plus, it'll give you here. Plus plus here. If you do plus plus, it'll give you here. Plus plus, and eventually get a plus plus over here. Um, so, yeah, it'll, it'll basically throw you off the end. Um, and that's what is happening here, right? So as you keep on plus plusing it, eventually you'll hit v dot end, and you want to stop the loop there. You don't want to do your reference act. That's illegal. You're already out of bounds. So you can see already here, right? Using these half open ranges makes for a very nice code. If there's a reason why they have that convention. Everything becomes much simpler if you do this half open stuff. Because you just stop here immediately. It's like the for loop just works. OK, um, so the first algorithm we're going to talk about is sort. Um, so th this is the sorts arrange, right? Um, it takes n log n time, as you would expect. Um, so yeah, so it takes in two two iterators, which I said before is a half open interval for sorting. So here we have a vector, right? Uh, and we can just sort that entire vector by passing a dot begin and one past the end, which is dot end. Um, you can sort a list, right? Uh, uh, not a list, an array. 
um, just by passing uh, the iterators for the range you want to sort. So here, if you want to sort the entire array, right, uh, you can just pass in the the array itself, which will decay into the position for the starting element for b0 here. And if you want half open, you just add the size of the array, and that'll be past the one past the end, which is again, you see how the code is very nice if you use half open stuff. Uh, similarly, if you want to sort the first, like say, k elements of a vector, exact same thing works. You do sort a dot begin, a dot begin plus k. Again, very nice because it's half open. Everything's half open. Um, you can also sort using reverse iterators here, so and the, and the vector will end up being sorted backwards. It's kind of fun. Um, the reason that works is because um, the the sort algorithm sorts it in the order that plus plus and minus minus sort of work in, but reverse iterators, if you add and subtract for them, it'll sort it'll like do it backwards, right? Uh, addition in the reverse iterator is like subtraction in the normal iterator, so the entire thing happens backwards. But the sort algorithm doesn't know that it's being passed reverse iterators. It just sees two iterators that move that you can add to and subtract from to move back and forth and within your container, in your range. So it just tries to sort it with respect to that. But in actuality, in the underlying container, it's being sorted backwards. So then maybe this will kind of sort of help you see why uh, the algorithms are, are implemented the way they are, where they use iterators as opposed to containers. Because it lets you write them much more generally and powerfully. Yeah, exactly. So it sorts of vector decreasing. OK, next one is reverse. Uh, so this is reverse the entire range. Not, not much to see here, uh, I don't think. There is something funny going oh, on. Oh, yeah, there is that going on. Yeah, I didn't want to explain that. Uh, I mean, yeah, sure. So if you look at line 3, you have reverse. And uh, you can actually do reverse with reverse iterators as well, which is just the funny thing that you can do. I don't think magical going on, but it'll just reverse it the same as if you pass the normal iterators. OK, let's move on. Uh, so OK, this is another nice uh, algorithm, is another function, is the fill, fill n memset sort of family of uh, functions. So well, fill and fill and fill, fill n are the real sort of associated ones. Memset sort of I just threw, threw on the slide as, as an afterthought. Um, so the idea here is that fill and fill n uh, fill a range, as their name sounds, with as the same value. Um, so if you do fill and you pass it a range, and a value, it'll fill the entire, the first n elements of that range with x. Um, fill n, you don't have to pass it a range. You just pass the starting iterator, and you pass how many you want to go up for. It's the sorted or right, uh, usually. Um, and then this is a, bo they both do the same thing here. Just uh, here, you don't, if, you don't, if you're using uh, vectors, it's less typing for f using fill n as supposed to fill. Um, it'll just fill it up. And you don't need to manually set the values of loop or anything. Um, the other sort of way to do this is supposed to fill and fill n is use the old C uh, function memset from like the string header, um, and this is I, I personally personal opinion sort of easier to use uh, with less typing and uh, is, this is especially true if your uh, container has like multiple dimensions if your array has multiple dimensions uh, like you would for a DP or something um, like a DP here. Um, the sort of caveat with memset that makes it harder to use is that it only works on single bytes as opposed to general like type value types. Um, however, if you're using zeros and negative one, if you're setting stuff to zero and negative one, or a few other special values that I never actually use, um, it doesn't matter. So, so like an int, right, is like four bytes. Um, so it, it doesn't matter that you're setting single bytes to the value zero, right? Because when you smush them all together and look at it as an int, zero as an int or zero as a car or as a, a byte doesn't matter. It's all zero. And a similar thing happens with negative one. So you would use it like this: you would memset the container. Uh, negative one and then the size of the container. You can size those. How many, how many of them you want to set it? But with multiple dimensions, very nice. You just do like this, which doesn't you cannot do with fill n. Um, you just it just works for multiple dimensions as it would for single. So and if you want to maybe set just the first, uh, just the, the DP zero right, which is like a two D array now. If you set this part for the first axis being zero. That also just just works with them set, which is really cool. Okay. Um, 
Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, lower bound and upper bound, and these are binary search uh, algorithms. So these, what these let you do is if you have some sort of range where all the elements are already sorted for you, um, you can binary search on them. Um, and so these functions return an iterator to a position in the array after the binary search concludes. Right? Um, and there's actually not just a single function. There's actually two functions, lower bound and upper bound, that implement binary search. Um, and the reason that we have two is because lower bound finds the first element that is greater than or equal to, the, to your search value. Um, and upper bound finds the first element which is greater than your search value. So there's a slight distinction here. And sort of the reason why we have it this way, and the reason for the naming here, a good way to remember it, um, is that these lower bound and upper bound give you uh, a half open range for where all the values are equal to x. So if you look here, right, if you lower bound 3 gives this first value is equal to 3, and upper bound 3 gives the first value that's greater than 3. So you can see that they form a half open range, just like I've been talking about all this while, uh, for where all the values are equal to 3. So that, that's why that's why that. That's where the name exists, and that's why there's two of them. They actually perform different functions once you have a, bu uh, a bunch of times that, a, a bunch of repeats for a value. They actually perform different functions. Um, so here's an example of using it. So you can binary search on an array, uh, on, a, on a vector here, right? Or binary search on a vector, sorted vector. And you don't have to binary search on just like numbers or something. You can binary search on any comparable type. So here I'm doing it on a pair of LLs, right? So I'm binary searching for this first, first value is greater than or equal to 7, 1. Um, and so this returns an iterator, right? the iterator pointing to that thing. Um, but since these are random iterators, I can do math on them like before. Remember, the vector iterators, I can just do whatever math I want. So I can subtract them from the iterator point to the begin, and that'll actually give me the index of where that thing is. It's like a number. It'll give me the number, which is the index for that position, where the first element greater than or equal to this is. Um, I can binary search on an array, right? Um, and that also can be an iterator or a pointer, right? and then I can dereference it like I would any other iterator, and that'll give me the first value, which is greater than uh, 10 in this range, in this array. Okay? Okay, there's more stuff on upper bound, lower bound. So, if uh, this element doesn't exist, or, or that's the bad way of putting it, but if the element you search by is the biggest, is bigger than any other element, right, in the uh, range, it'll return your one past the n, return the a dot n, uh, uh, the second, the second sort of thing you pass to it, it'll return the end of the range. Um, so, like for example, with lower bound, if your thing you pass, if your lower bound, let's say number is one to ten, right, and you pass the number eleven, right, it'll just return the second thing you pass, the the, the end uh, iterator. I mean, if you're doing upper bound, right, and you pass it, let's say 10, right, it's the only have elements less than or equal to it, it'll do the same thing and give you the n iterator. And so that's a nice way of checking whether or not an element is the sort of path is greater than everything else in, the, in your list, right? Um, so yeah, so if you binary search um, on on this element, right, using lower bound, and if, but if it equals the end, you say x, there, there is no next element, there is no element greater than or equal to me. Um, but if there is one, if it's not equal to n, there is an element that's greater than or equal to me, and that's just by dereference the iterator that you get back by calling lower bound. Um, so notice uh, these sort of two functions, they give you how to find greater than and greater than or equal to. But what if you want to find, instead of the first element greater than or first element greater than or equal to, you want to find the last element that's less than you, right? Or the, yeah, so, if, so what you can do is call lower bound to get the first element greater than or equal to, and then move left by one. So I can do the first element less than you. And you can do the same thing for like the last element less than or equal to you with, uh, with upper bound. You do upper bound minus 1, that gives the last element less than or equal to you. So here's how that looks in code. You do a lower bound, right? And then if it equals a dot begin, right, the first thing you pass to it, uh, it's the smallest element in the list, right, in the range. So there's nothing to the left of you. And then, and then subtract it, and then so going to the left by 1 would actually move you out of bounds, right? It would be 1 before the end, before the beginning, and the dereference will cause an error, it'll be illegal. So then you say it's the smallest element. There's nothing to the left of me. Um, otherwise, you have to move to the left by one, and then you say, okay, the previous element, the last element less than equal less than me, was this dereference thing here. So here's here you see we're doing math on iterators again. Um, lower bound and upper bound is, are very often confusing to remember. It took me a while to get to get it in my head which one's which, but um, it's good to pay attention to this and. Uh, to, to be uh, sure which one is which, so then when you actually start writing code with this, you don't spend forever figuring stuff out.
Okay. Um, sort of last thing on lower bound, upper bound is that uh, it, these these functions they expect random access iterators. If you remember from the slides way before, random access iterators um, like vectors offer or arrays offer let you do math on them, right? So you can jump around as much as you want, right, and in all one time. Sets and maps, since you're on like a tree structure, not an array structure, they don't let you do that. You can't jump around arbitrarily. You can only move uh, up uh, forward or backward one at a time. Um, so there, you can't really pass into lower bound or upper bound. However, because they have this binary, nice binary tree structure, they actually implement their own lower bound, upper bound using custom code. That's not the same code as uh, vectors or array that the other or the other one does. And to use it, you use it like this. You use like a dot lower bound, uh, which is kind of strange because all the other uh, algorithms have been like sort of global algorithms that you pass uh, things to. This is the only sort of implementation way, uh, detail, because of the implementation details that I mentioned before, that is like a tree structure. Um, uh, they're able to sort of have this member function where you do dot lower bound or dot upper bound and the value to search on a set or a map. And again, these return an iterator into the set or into the map. So, yes, yeah, so if you ever try to write lower bound and you give it like set that begins set that end, it's going to complain. The compiler is going to yell at you. So you have to write it like this instead. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've mentioned a couple algorithms, right? And th these sort of algorithms. Uh, most, a lot of them depend on a notion of like comparison, right? Of less than or which one's less than, which one's greater. So, sorting um, the sort algorithm obviously de depends on an ordering, right? Um, but so does lower bound and upper bound. They, you sort of have this, this notion of less than or less than or less than equal to or greater than or whatever, right? Um, and so by by for numbers, that's just obvious what that is, right? But for um, your uh, and and as I mentioned before, uh, other STL types have their own nation notion of like less than or greater than, right? Um, for, for pairs, it's lexicographic. Uh, also for vectors and strings, it's lexicographic. Um, but what if you have your own type, right, and you want to write your own comparator? Or what if you want to have a different comparator for a, one of the built-in types? Well, it's very easy to do um, for, for the algorithms, and it's even easier to do if you use the lambda syntax. Um, so here's how you actually do it. So you sort of, after you write the rest of your sort of the, f the normal parameters that you pass into your algorithm, uh, it's not. I think C++11 and C++14 have it. It's not that new. Um, a lot of this, uh, different, a lot of new syntax being added to lambdas for C++17 and 20. Um, but this, this as is, is uh, quite a few years old at this point. Um, so uh, yeah, so you would pass the usual uh, parameters to your algorithm, and you'd also pass this as, as a comparator. So this comparator can be a few different things. It can be just a normal function pointer, like you would do in C. It can be a function type, which you would see in C++, but it's often useless to use. I, I don't think I've ever used that in, in competitive programming code, actually, like function types. Um, uh, but Or you can use, which is the most convenient, is this lambda thing. Um, and so what you can do with the lambda is that you just write a function body, basically, and no header, um, and, and just drop it into your code, and it just works. Um, so you have to do this sort of bracket things in the beginning just to show that you're starting a lambda. And this and thing here is uh, what stuff you're capturing. Don't worry, don't worry about that if you don't know what capturing is for a lambda. Um, just put that in your code every time. You can look it up if you're interested. But just if you want your things to work nicely, just put, put this and symbol in there uh, in the brackets. Um, then you put your type. So for a sorting function, for comparison a lambda, right, you always take two things. You're two, you take your two things that you're comparing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and just captures everything in the outer scope. Um, and more specifically, and captures by reference. Um, you can also do an equals and not capture by value. But that might be too slow, right? Because you don't maybe don't want to, you know, have big things in the outer scope that you don't want to pass by value. Um, so and, and does by reference. So, so, if you, yeah, so if you change anything, if you have this and here and you change anything from the outer scope in your lambda, it'll change that in the outer scope. It won't do like make, it, make a copy of it. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so for a comparator, you always have two things of the same type, the two things that you're comparing. Um, and so you write your normal comparison logic and you return some sort of Boolean, right? So it depends to, to be whether it's less than, greater than, or equal, right? Uh, greater than or not. 
whether or not the first element is less than the second element, right? So here, for example, I don't know, I'm sorting an array of, of doubles, right? And I'm sorting them, let's say, by their sign of their angles. A bunch of angles, and I'm sorting them by the sign. Maybe that's something you want to do for a geometry problem. And so this is how you would do it. You should return whether or not this, the first guy is less than the second guy. OK? Um, and so something I want to stress here, um, this is not about lambdas in general, but specifically about comparators, whether or not you use lambdas, whether you use lambdas or normal function pointers, something about the comparators um, is that you have to uh, obey what's called, they have, to be, they have to implement what's called a strict weak ordering. Um, and so what that means is that A uh, has to be transitive, right? So if you have A less than B and B less than C, uh, A has to be less than C, that's often not an issue for most sort of orderings that you implement. Um, and also, uh, uh, but, but the sort of the real sort of uh, issue is uh, that most people get into is that it has to be strict. And what that means is that if two elements are sort of equal in your ordering, you have to return false for that. Um, what this comparator has to do is return whether or not the first element is less than, strictly less than, the second element. And so if it's equal, you want to return false. Um, and this is not like a small detail. This is if you don't do this properly, it's gonna it might runtime error. And again, as with most runtime errors that you see, it's not, it might not it, as, as your luck may have it, it might not runtime error on your own computer. But then when you submit this to, to code forces, it's going to RT uh, test case 100, and you'll be stuck there scratching your head. So make sure you get that right. Uh, stick that in your head that if it's equal, you want to return false. Okay. Um, so you can use these comparators not only for these algorithms, but also for like sets and maps. Because I mentioned before, uh, sets and maps are sorted, um, and you can define how they're going to be sorted. And so this is the syntax of how to do it. So you just define a lambda. Uh, the decal type is so you don't have to type out the type of the lambda, which can get annoying because lambdas have like function weird function types. Um, and then just pass it the actual comparator. Pass in the lambda here. Okay. Uh, can I ask, um, so if you, for your comparator, if you uh, return true for equal, why would that mess it up? Uh, because the algorithms expect it to uh, not return uh, true for equal. I understand, but like when you're actually doing a sorting, right? Like yeah. if I erroneously say that, oh, these two, like two is less than two, right? Yeah. Why would I actually mess it up? Uh, because it, what if it calls it on itself, right? Uh, maybe, I'm not, I'm not, okay, I'm not sure of the exact details for, for maybe sort, right? But maybe, for example, binary search, right? It might cause it to go out of bounds or something, right? And in which case it will, uh, uh, it'll cause it a, a, a runtime error, right? Because, for example, for, for binary search, I think, um, if, if you're sort of, let me think about why exactly it would do that, right? Yeah, and on binary search, like, it wants to tell you if it is there or not. But, I mean, it would say the minus index, right, instead. Is that how binary search works in C++? Uh, like, it would sure. think it's not in there, right? Let me think about it. Um, I, I, it's not just binary search. Actually, I, I know sort also RTs when you give it. Really? This, yeah. Uh, so one reason maybe right if it's doing some if it's uh, doing some sort of you know, quick some partitioning thing right maybe maybe the sort algorithm right is a partitioning, right? Then maybe uh, as it moves stuff around, it'll. That's okay. Or it just put an equal element on one side or the other, right? Like if I partition is five, instead of be on the left side, it'll be on the right side or something, and then it'll just ah, do ah, quick ah, sort again. Ah, no, no, I got yeah. It. What if you have three equal elements, right? Okay. And it'll return, uh, and then you might have a cycle. Cycle on what? On like less than less than in the sort of less than property, right? You will have a less than b less than c less than a. I mean, you can have a cycle of even two elements. I just don't see how that would happen. I, I, it doesn't. It doesn't matter well, that much. Pass, but... okay. I, it, it will RT though. Like it's not. I'm not making this up. Uh, okay. No. No. Yeah. I, I believe you. I was just wondering why. Because. Yeah. Okay. Well. So, well. For example, with because if you're binary searching, right, and you just don't the invariant is not maintained, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. For binary search, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I don't know. I'm not sure if sort actually RTs. Maybe, maybe it won't. I don't know. Maybe it depends on the implementation of the sort. I, I've seen binary search RT, but I, maybe I, I don't think I've actually personally seen sort RT. But I've seen blogs online where people complain about this and stuff. So I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so here's some other algos. They're uh, 
the same sort of format as the other ones, so they take in a half open range um, and some useful ones. So first up, partial sum. In a, in a lot of problems, you, it's very useful to construct an array of partial sums, right? So the sum of the first element, sum of the first two elements, sum of the first three elements, sum of the fourth element, so on and so forth, right? Construct an array of partial sums. Um, and there's a built-in function which does that for you. So what, the way it works is that it takes in half open range for the element you're sum, the array you're summing up, for the range you're summing up, and then it takes just a start iterator for the output sort of place where you're putting the the answer. Um, and this, by the way, the output thing can be the same as the input thing, which is kind of nice. And um, then this accumulate function, which takes in again a range and then a starting value, and it gives a sum of the entire range. You know, nice way of writing just summing up a range. Um, sort of one thing here is you want to give it a uh, zero LL, not zero, uh, because otherwise it'll, imp it'll uh, implicitly sort of guess the type of your answer is going to be an int and not an LL, and then you'll overflow, which is really annoying. Uh, there's a count function, which counts how many times this last element appears in this range. The unique function, which unifies this range, which deletes all duplicates, and then returns the uh, end one past the end pointer for the new range after it's unique. Like it shortens a range, right? Because it's deleted a bunch of stuff, and then returns a new one past the end pointer for you. Yeah. Yeah, you you also alloc it before doing that. If you don't want to alloc your vector, you can do something called like a back inserter. You can look that up. Uh, I think CP reference has stuff on that. I, I, I think it's a page for partial sum uh, has an example using a back inserter if you don't want to alloc it yourself. But it's often just nicer just to insert much less code, just allocating beforehand, just make a vector of size n and then doing it. OK, so it's unique. Then this iota, which sort of fills a range in ascending elements of ascending order. So if we do it like this, we'll fill it with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up. Um, then there's min element, max element for a range. And as you may guess, it returns an iterator to the min element of the max element. In that range. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other um, uh, algorithms in the in the library, but you can just go on CPP reference and just look at them and uh, just see what they do. Um, uh, it's not really super useful to cover a huge amount of them right now. Just browse which ones you need uh, as you need them, I think. But the point I want to show is they're all sort of obey the same principle and same conventions of taking in half open ranges and working on iterators. So I think uh, for partial sum, if you just replace everything with reverse iterators, then you would get a uh, suffix sum, which is nice. Oh shit, that's cool. Uh, you can use uh, most of these on arrays too, or I think all of them. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, arrays are just a generalization of pointers. So pointers themselves, like arrays, right, um, are random access iterators themselves. You can pass them in as you need for any of these guys um, instead of vector uh, iterators or set iterators. Yeah, exactly. So here, uh, just A itself, as I mentioned before, will be equivalent to the begin iterator. And A plus N, right, because it would be like A N, which is sort of out of bounds of the array. Would be would you want equivalent to the one past the n dot n iterator? Um, there also isn't really a downside to using vectors, by the way. Like they're as fast and have pretty much as much memory as uh, arrays, and just expected two x like sort of uh, slowdown that you would have from the reallocation. Um, I sort of like using arrays more than vectors just because they're slightly less typing, um, and you can yeah and you can declare them outside statically, and it's kind of nice that way. Um, but I think Adam he uses vectors like almost completely, right? So. I think I tend to use arrays um, when I'm doing TPs, but not much otherwise. Okay. Oh, and for graphs, I tend to make a array of vectors. OK. Uh, yeah, that's good. As I was saying before, there's a whole bunch of different algorithms you can look up. Um, it's really fun to browse through them and see what cool stuff you can do. But uh, they, but they're often not super duper useful for a competitive programming task, I think, like the more esoteric ones, as even as cool as they sound. Uh, these are probably the ones you use the most often. OK. Uh, Joe, do you want to take this part? Because this seems something 
Uh, sure, I can take it. You part. have a lot of stuff on this, right? Okay. Um, so in our last few slides, we're going to be talking about macros, um, which are a really nice way um, that you can sort of streamline your code a bit, make it easier to read, easier to write. Um, so yeah, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so basically the idea behind a macro is um, you give it like a text replacement pattern um, and you can sort of uh, write like a shortcut for like a given piece of code that you want to use a lot. Um, so like some quick examples are like, um, this is one I like to do, uh, K and V for first and second. Um, it just saves you like four or five characters uh, every time you do that. And when you start having like pairs of pairs um, and like maps and all that stuff, it makes it um, a lot easier to write. Um, so yeah, then whenever you want to use first or second, um, you can just do dot K or dot V instead. Um, and you could call these um, sort of anything as long as it's like a valid C token. Um, I, I just use I just use K and V because it's like key value pair. Um, and then as like another example, you can do a similar thing for tuples. Like if you know your tuples are all going to have three things in them, uh, you can have these macros uh, that sort of extract your three uh, pieces of the tuple. Um, so like here on the bottom, uh, if you do G1 of T, that would be the same as get one of T. And one uh, important thing to think about with these macros is it really is just like a text replacement. Um, like it, it's not like uh, creating a function or anything like that. It's actually just going through your code, finding every occurrence of like this text pattern and like replacing your code with like this other piece of code. Um, so yeah, yes, next slide. So one, one example of like this, oh, yeah, okay. So one example of this, like basically just being text replacement is if you look on the bottom left, um, there's this EX macro, um, which basically will print out uh, whatever argument you feed into it and then exit. Um, and notice that you can give it like ridiculous arguments like this. Um, like you can give it a string and then um, like the C out um, append, thing and then x um, and that's it's it's not like a single um like variable or anything like that um but again because it's just doing a text replacement it will put this in the place of x inside the macro uh, which will turn it into um the line you see on the bottom there where it's printing out x equals and then x so it really is just a text replacement um and yeah so uh in that last example uh, the macro had a parameter. And that's uh, probably the most useful part of the macros um, is you can sort of pass arguments into them, um, which lets you do a lot of really nice things. Um, so like these, these ones on the right are um, the ones that we use the most often. Um, so for example, GX uh, will declare a new um, long, long variable X and then read it in. So if you have some local variable, you don't want to have to like declare it outside or anything. You just want to like get its value in now. Uh, you can use that macro. Um, you can also make a for loop macro, which makes for loops a lot shorter to write. Um, like if you're doing just like the normal increasing for loop from like some position, some some left position to some right position, uh, you can do something like this f i l r. Uh, so like you can see in this example here. Instead of writing for LLI equals zero, I less than N, I plus plus, we just have to write this F I zero N. Um, and it does the same thing. And then another nice one is uh, the A macro, which uh, we just went over all those functions that you can do on vectors, um, where like you have to pass in the begin and the end iterators. But if you have the A macro, you can just do uh, AX instead of X dot begin, X dot end. So that's what we're doing here at the bottom with this. Um, sort. So we're, we're using the same uh, sort function from before, but with the macro, it's just shorter to write. And then if you have any like constants that you want to declare, that's macros are a nice way to do that, because then you can like declare um, global arrays with like a fixed size like that. 
So like if, if you know that your array is never going to be bigger than 10 to the fifth, you can just make um, your arrays like 10 to the fifth or something. All right, uh, any questions on this so far? All right, so next slide. So one thing you have to be careful about with macros is um, a lot of times you'll have to put parentheses around the arguments inside your formula. Um, so for example, if you look at this first example for the square macro, uh, if you're like trying to write a macro that like squares x, right? Um, the first way would be kind of your first, like sort of the intuitive way to do it, right? Um, but the problem with that is, uh, again, it is just text replacement. So if you try to square, say, 3 plus 5, that'll expand out to 3 plus 5 times 3 plus 5. But there's no parentheses there. Um, so you're actually going to get 23 instead of 64, because you're going to do that middle multiplication first before you do the additions. Um, but if you put parentheses around them inside the macro definition, um, then that problem will basically go away. Um, so yeah. It, they're not uh, always necessary, but it's usually better to be safe. Um, so, like if you if we uh, if you look at the ex example from the last slide, in that case, um, if we'd put the if we put the parentheses around x in there, then that would not have compiled. Um, so that's a case where you wouldn't want to have the parentheses. But anything where you're doing uh, sort of arithmetic operations, like any like multiplication or addition, um, any bitwise stuff too, uh, you really want to be careful with that and add the parentheses because that can lead to a lot of problems. All right. And then uh, the last thing we want to talk about is multi-line macros. Um, so you can make your macros sort of go past one line um, by adding the uh, backslash at the end of the line. And then you can go arbitrarily many lines, just add a slash after every line except the last one. So for example, if we have this read array macro um, where it takes in like an array and the number of things to read, and then it reads in that many things from CN, um, you'd have those slashes at the end of the lines just to make sure that, that worked. You could also write it all in one line, but this just makes it a lot more readable. So yeah, anyone have any questions on macros? OK, um, so that was all we had for today. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Keith. Yeah, so thank you guys for coming. 